Welcome to our last lecture of the semester. It is Wednesday, December the 1st at about 1.30 in the afternoon. And for our final class, I want to talk about the Cold War. And there's going to be two parts. There's going to be something specifically on the Cold War and then a short PowerPoint on the Vietnam War specifically. And World War II is going to leave Europe in the same devastated shape it had been after World War I, only in worse condition. Uh, the advanced technology of World War II it allowed armies to destroy more property and destroy more lives than ever before. And there were some real worries that history would repeat itself, leading to a second worldwide depression and another war. And the second depression is going to be averted by the Marshall Plan. Uh, the Marshall Plan is named for George Marshall, who was the U.S. Secretary of State, and it was this plan to pump about $12 billion worth of economic aid into the war-torn countries of Western Europe. In today's money, that is somewhere between $170 and $200 billion. Now, the ultimate result is that Western Europe is going to be rebuilt, and the European Economic Community, known as the EEC, is going to be created. Uh, another word for that is the common market, and the EEC goal was the gradual economic cooperation of countries in Europe, the elimination of trade barriers between countries, the strengthening of national economies, and the eventual adoption of a unified currency, which we know today as the euro. Um, the European Union that we have today is a direct result of the Marshall Plan of 1945 and 1946. We also have to talk about the United Nations. Uh, think of this like the League of Nations 2.0. The UN, it's formed after World War II and it's a forum where all the countries of the world can resolve their conflicts peacefully. Um, while some conflicts have broken out since then, uh, the United Nations has done a fairly good job of keeping the overall peace, and it gives a place where all the different countries of the world can unite. And the United States, like I said, it's done a very good job of keeping control of conventional warfare, but it did not and has not stopped the war of ideologies. You still have a difference in thought between those who are in communist countries and those that are in uh, Western democratic countries. The Cold War, which begins in the 1940s and lasts up until the, uh, the mid-90s, uh, that's really going to be the determining factor for international relations for about 45 years or so, and it still has residual effects today. And just like any war, there are at least two sides. And in the Cold War, the adversaries were the, uh, the quote, free world and the communist world. The free world consisted of the, of the United States, Western Europe, especially England and France, and other democratic nations. And then the communist world was the Soviet Union, North Korea, China, uh, Vietnam, and some other places. And these two sides break down into alliances. For the Western alliances, you have the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, you have the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, and then you have ANZUS, which was Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. And then in the Western Hemisphere, closer to home, we had the Pan American Union, which later becomes the Organization of American States. In response to these alliances formed by the free world, the communist nations are going to form the Warsaw Pact. And members of the Warsaw Pact were the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics, better known as the Soviet Union. Eastern European countries that were controlled by the Soviet Union and a couple other allies such as Cuba. Now the communist world also included China, but China and the Soviet Union did not trust each other, so China was not part of the Warsaw Pact. Just like any war, there are some battlefields, but since this isn't a conventional war, we don't have conventional battlefields. Um, a lot of the initial struggle is over control of Eastern Europe. The 
Potsdam, P-O-T-S-D-A-M, the Potsdam Conference that went from July 17th to August 7th, or August 2nd of 1945. Uh, that meeting, which is right at the end of World War II, did not go so well. Uh, Harry Truman meets with the Soviet Union Foreign Minister Molotov. Uh, it's decided that Germany will be broken up into different parts. The borders of Germany are decided. It's decided that Japan will be forced to surrender unconditionally. And both sides have disagreements over just about everything else. The meeting ends. Both the United States and the Soviet Union are angry. Both the United States and the Soviet Union distrust each other. And one of the big parts of the war is going to be containment and then challenging each other for the the third world if you will now what was a third world country well that is the first battlefield and a third world country at this time just meant a country that was not aligned with the east or the west very often these third world countries are going to be located in southeast asia they're going to be located in africa it's going to be places such as the the um, Koreas, North and South Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and then the former African colonies that are beginning to get their independence. Uh, usually these countries are going to be rich in resources, rich in manpower, but they are also going to be very poorly developed. Uh, when colonization ends in Africa, a power vacuum is developed and a lot of these countries are just left in poor shape politically and poor shape economically. And the, the struggle for these countries is gonna be one of the primary places that the, uh, the Cold War takes place. Beyond that, though, we also have nuclear weapons. Um, while nuclear weapons are not going to be used during the Cold War, they are always a constant thought. Uh, the United States is the only country to drop atomic bombs on somebody in an offensive way. Uh, the atomic bomb hit Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945, and the atomic bomb hit Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945, and ended World War II. It's estimated that about 100,000 people died at Hiroshima, about 75,000 people died at Nagasaki, and it becomes this idea that only superior weapons will keep somebody else from using a nuclear bomb. And the death tolls at Hiroshima, the death tolls at Nagasaki show how dangerous these bombs could be. So by the end of the 1960s, there are a total of six nations with nuclear capability. There's the United States, there's the Soviet Union, China, England, France, and India. Now you might be asking, why did India have nuclear weapons? It's because they were afraid of both sides. They were afraid of both East and West. India was one of these third world countries and they wanted to protect themselves. Adding to those original six, today Israel, North Korea, and Pakistan have nuclear weapons as well. Trying to stay ahead in the arms race, the United States begins to develop hydrogen bombs, and that's a bomb so powerful that it took an atomic bomb to explode it and make it detonate. Uh, from there, you go on to neutron bombs and cobalt bombs, and it's all about more bombs, bigger bombs, better bombs, and the 1960s becomes this arms race. Now, the United States and the Soviet Union each felt the other side would be deterred in launching a first strike by the fact that both countries would suffer ultimate destruction by a nuclear war. And this becomes the concept of mutually assured destruction, a.k.a. MAD. Um, you create and have so many nuclear weapons that your enemy dare not use theirs against you. There were more nuclear weapons than what were needed to destroy humanity. And at pretty much every point in the, the way, the United States has a four to one superiority in destructive capability. A 
another big battlefield of World War II is just the United States versus Soviet Union. As I said, disagreements at the Potsdam Conference mean that the United States and the Soviet Union cannot stand each other. They don't agree with each other. And the United States is going to try and contain the spread of communism. In 1947, President Harry Truman is going to issue what becomes known as the Truman Doctrine. And in the Truman Doctrine, it's decided that the U.S. must support free people around the world who are resisting efforts by outsiders or armed minorities to overthrow their government. To put that in common language, the Truman Doctrine in 1947 says that the United States will support those who are against communism. The United States will help stop communism from spreading. One of the first actual disputes during the Cold War happens in June of 1948 in the city of Berlin. After World War II, Germany is split into two parts, East Germany, West Germany. The city of Berlin, which is fully enclosed within Eastern Germany, that city is split into East Berlin and West Berlin. Well, in June of 1948, Stalin orders a Soviet blockade around the Western sectors of Berlin in an effort to force the United States, Britain, and France to abandon the city. And over the next 10 months, the United States is going to lead an effort to ship two and a half million tons of food, fuel, and supplies into West Berlin. And it's all done by airplane. Uh, airplanes go in and out of the city day, day in, day out, 24 hours a day. And once it becomes clear 10 months later that the city of West Berlin was not going to be um, starved, Joseph Stalin finally lifts the blockade. After the events of the Berlin airlift, uh, the Truman government decides that the U.S. could no longer rely on others to take the initiative in resisting communism. And the United States, in April of 1950, is going to issue a report that is now known as NSC-68. And NSC-68 publicly states that the U.S. must take the lead in stopping communism wherever it occurred, regardless of the strategic or economic value of that area to the United States. And this leads to a major expansion of the American military power. Uh, this leads to a huge increase in defense spending. And this document, NSC 68, is going to dictate our response to communism all the way up until the 1980s. It's going to play a major role in how we look at countries trying to gain independence. It's going to play a major role in how we look at revolutions throughout the world. And it plays a major part into the role the United States will play in Korea, in Cuba, in Vietnam, you name it. In other words, NSC 68, wherever communism tries to spread, we will stop it, whether it's in a country, a bathtub, a rest area, wherever it might be. Cuba is going to be a big deal. Um, in the 1950s, Cuba had a dictator named Fulgencio Batista. Now, Bautista is popular with the free world outside of Cuba, but he's very unpopular with most Cuban people. And a Cuban rebel group, originally peaceful, led by Fidel Castro, um, start to agitate and start to demand that Bautista be removed. Now, these Cuban rebels were popular at first. Fidel Castro does a tour of the United States, appears on the Ed Sullivan Show, and even meets in 1958 with then Vice President Richard Nixon. And Fidel Castro is going to talk with Richard Nixon about nationalizing industry. And that sounds strangely socialist communist. And so the United States turns down Castro for support. Because the United States turns down Fidel Castro, he then turns to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union agrees to help him. 
So by the time we get to 1959, Castro has help from the Soviet Union. Castro overthrows Fulgencio Batista, and many Cuban businessmen flee the country as their wealth is confiscated, and as a result, Castro becomes very unpopular in the United States. Now, almost as soon as this happens, the United States President uh, Dwight Eisenhower, he sets up a plan to help Cuban refugees regain power. And he comes up with this idea, along with the CIA, of invading Cuba. And this invasion plan becomes known as the Bay of Pigs. Uh, let me just say, it ends completely in disaster. Uh, when John F. Kennedy becomes president in 1961, he's convinced by the CIA, Cuban exiles, and even the mafia that going ahead with this Bay of Pigs invasion is a good idea. So April 1961, about 1,500 anti-Castro exiles who are trained by the American government land at the Bay of Pigs in southern Cuba. The invasion is a complete fiasco because most Cubans support Castro. Um, the, the invasion is stopped, and John F. Kennedy is forced to accept blame. Uh, he does not apologize, but he does create blame, or he does accept blame, I should say. And this creates a lot of resentment towards the United States from Latin American leaders, both in Central and South America. Now, going on from there, in early October 1962, a U.S. spy plane and some satellites are going to go over Cuba and take pictures. And these photographs reveal that there's a Soviet missile base along with missiles being installed on the coast of Cuba. Um, Cuba is about 90 miles or so south of Miami, so it's very close. Uh, Kennedy responds strongly. He condemns on national TV what he calls a provocative threat to world peace. John F. Kennedy issues this public ultimatum demanding that the missiles be removed and places a blockade around Cuba. Um, JFK also says that the United States will remove these missiles by force if the Soviet Union does not agree to move them voluntarily. Well, the leader of the Soviet Union, he was a guy named Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, Khrushchev denounces the blockade, tries to fuel the missiles to get ready for launch, U.S. forces are put on high alert. A invasion is designed and prepared of the Cuban island. And all the world can do is watch in horror as the two sides go to the blink of nuclear war. Um, at the last minute, uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev are finally able to reach an agreement. Uh, the Soviet Union agrees to remove missiles from Cuba if the United States agrees not to attack Cuba and to remove missiles from Turkey. So Cuba is solved, but then we have to worry about the space race. Uh, the space race is one place where the Soviet Union gained an early advantage. Um, the idea behind this was if an orbiting space station could be put into uh, space, that it could be used to spy on the world and it could be used as a launching point of nuclear weapons and everybody was freaked out. Um, Soviet Union is going to launch the first satellite. It's known as Sputnik 1. So Sputnik 1 is launched into space October 4th, 1957. The world was not expecting it. It's the first man-made object to to navigate around the to orbit the earth is what i should say sputnik 2 which i'll talk about here in just a moment was launched in november of 1957 and the first u.s satellites not launched until 1958 it's known as explorer 1. in november of 1957 the soviet union sends up the first animal in space and it is a dog it was a stray dog from the streets of moscow named laika and laika is put aboard sputnik 2 it's a one-way trip laika does not survive um, but it proves that beings can go to space and beginning in 1961 the united states will send chimpanzees 
In April of 1961, the first human goes to space, and that is Yuri Gagarin of the Soviet Union. And Alan Shepard will become the first American in space in May of 1961. So the space race is heating up, but the Soviet Union has been winning the race up to this point. So the United States is going to promise to be the first country to put a man on the moon. And JFK famously says that we will do that by the end of the 1960s. So the National Aeronautics and Space Administration is formed, better known as NASA. NASA begins the Mercury program, the Gemini program, and the Apollo program. And somewhere around 20% of the entire um, funding of the government goes to space exploration. Finally, July of 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin will be the first humans and the first Americans on the moon. There is a third guy that was on the mission. I always mention him because nobody ever remembers to. His name was Michael Collins. Now the space race does move forward from there. Uh, the Soviet Union never completes a moon landing, but they do create a space station as does the United States. The U.S. space station was called Skylab and then Skylab 2. The Russian space station is called Mir. And then eventually now we have the International Space Station. Now after a real quick brief pause, I've got the Vietnam War PowerPoint up. And there's a lot of information in here. Um, if this was the face-to-face -face class, I would do an entire day on this, but for our purposes, and I don't mean to sound like you're, you're getting the cheaper end of the deal or anything like that, because I promise it's not. It's just um, I don't have to go as in detail as what I, I would normally. So for the Vietnam War lecture, uh, the stuff I really want you to know, uh, first thing is that Europeans reach Vietnam fairly early. Europeans are in Vietnam by 1498. Uh, the Jesuits who are mentioned with the, the Reformation, they are going to visit there very early. And the Europeans and the people of Vietnam are going to be in contact with each other from a very early time. That's the important thing to know here. Uh, eventually, Vietnam is going to become a French colony. And that goes all the way back to 1771. There's a rebellion called the Taysan Rebellion. And three brothers, the Taysan brothers, are going to take over the government. And the heir to the throne, the emperor's son, is going to try and get the throne back. And to do that, the emperor's son is going to contact the French. The French agree to help in exchange for a, a player to be named later, so to speak. Well, in 1847 and 1848, the French begin to force the emperor of Vietnam to give up power. And slowly but surely, Vietnam is going to become a colony of France. By 1883, Vietnam is completely under French control and anti-French movements begin. By the time we get to 1916, the first mass rebellion breaks out. A 16-year-old who is the emperor, his name is Duy Tan. Uh, Duy Tan is going to escape from the, the palace, escape from French control, go into the mountains, and start a rebellion against France. Now, this rebellion is put down, but it is important because it shows how disliked the French are. Right around the same time this is going on, um, a man named Ho Chi Minh is becoming well known. Uh, Ho Chi Minh was born in 1890. His dad was a government worker who worked with the French. And Ho Chi Minh is actually in Paris while the Versailles Peace Treaty is being negotiated. As part of the, the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson, just in case you don't remember, one of those 14 points was to allow people to vote and choose their own destiny. And Ho Chi Minh is in Paris 
trying to convince European leaders to allow the Vietnamese to vote and decide if they're going to be um, a free country or not. Well, it doesn't work. The French are not going to have the Vietnamese gain their independence. And Ho Chi Minh is going to go on to be one of the founding members of the French Communist Party, the Vietnamese Count, uh, Communist Party, and even the French Indochina Communist Party as well. So Ho Chi Minh is going to become a communist, not because he thought it was the he basically thought it was the best way to help his people. Well, if you fast forward to World War II, the Japanese gain control of Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh fights against the Japanese. The Americans support him. And before you know it, August 28th, 1945, the Japanese know that they're losing the war. August 28th, 1945, the Japanese are going to surrender to Ho Chi Minh. And Ho Chi Minh declares an independent democratic republic of Vietnam. Uh, the problem with this, though, is the French don't agree. And after World War II, using quite a bit of that Marshall Plan money, the French are going to return to Vietnam. They're going to set up a new colonial government, and they're going to declare that Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese don't actually have their independence. And a war is going to break out between the French colonial forces and Ho Chi Minh's communist forces. This war is going to go all the way from February of 1945 to August of 1954, and it's known as the First Indochina War. Now, at the same time that this is going on, that Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union is starting to form. The United States gets involved in Vietnam, as does uh, both China and the Soviet Union. Two different countries are created in 1956 when a vote to decide whether Vietnam would be united as a communist country or not fails to happen. And as an attempt to stop the spread of communism, the United States agrees to give South Vietnam both direct economic aid and military advice and support. This was seen as a way to, con to contain communism based on both the Truman Doctrine and NSC 68 that I just mentioned. So in 1961, JFK is publicly going to announce support for South Vietnam. By December 1961, the first U.S. troops arrive in South Vietnam. And these soldiers are there just as advisors. They can't actually fight. But slowly but surely, the South Vietnamese government and the South Vietnamese army start to fall apart. By the time we get to November 1st, 1963, just a couple of weeks before Kennedy himself is assassinated, the leader of South Vietnam, a guy named Go Dinh Diem, is going to be executed with U.S. help. Um, South Vietnam has more than 10 governments in the next year and a half. South Vietnam is in absolutely no way a stable country. The United States really gets involved in this after something called the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, supposedly, and I do say supposedly because there's no proof this actually happened, in March of 1964, the United States starts leading coastal raids on the coastline of North Vietnam. On August 4th, supposedly uh, two U.S. destroyers, the USS Maddox, the USS Turner Joy, are fired on by North, uh, North Vietnamese uh, boats. There's no actual evidence of this. And um, the United States specifically Lyndon B. Johnson is going to say, we have been attacked by the enemy. We need to go to war in Vietnam. And on August 7th, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution is passed, giving LBJ permission to do whatever he wants in Vietnam. 
and he very quickly does. You can read here um, millions and millions of tons of bombs fall between March 2nd and March 31st. I have read that in that one month, more bombs were dropped than in all of World War II. So what does this mean for the United States and why is this important to the Cold War? This is going to be one of the few places where the American military faces off with the communist forces. Um, the first U.S. combat troop lands in March 8th of 1965. It's 3,500 Marines. By the end of December 1965, there's 200,000 U.S. soldiers there. And by 1968, that number is over half a million. Um, Adding to that, South Korea is going to add in another 300,000 troops. Um, on the communist side, you have the Viet Cong, who are South Vietnamese sympathizers who are on the communist side. There's the regular army of North Vietnam, but then also Cuba, the Soviet Union, China, and North Korea are all going to send troops to fight as well. So this is one of the few places where, where Western democratic forces and Eastern communist forces are in direct um, combat against each other. In January of 1968, an event known as the Tet Offensive occurs. Up to this point, the United States public and the world was being told that the war was almost over, that the United States was winning, but it very quickly proved not to be true when the North Vietnamese forces launched an attack on over a hundred different cities all at once. This becomes known as the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive militarily is a failure but it's psychologically devastating. Um, the American public loses support of the war. The American public feels that the government has been lying to them because, well, they're not winning. By 1969, the United States realizes that it is an unwinnable war. And in 1969 and 1970, uh, the president, Richard Nixon, announces that America is going to start withdrawing, but in April 1970, the United States invades another country, Cambodia. The U.S. public once again feels lied to and uh, war protests break out everywhere. <coughs> An anti-war movement forms here in America. Hundreds of thousands of people demonstrate and even Vietnam veterans turn against the war. In the end, in 1972, President Nixon holds secret negotiations with the leaders of North Vietnam. By January of 1973, a ceasefire agreement is reached, and by March of 1973, um, all U.S. forces are withdrawn from the country. Go into 1974, North Vietnam, South Vietnam are fighting each other again. And by the beginning of 1975, the South Vietnamese government ceases to function and the country falls to Vietnamese communist forces uh, by the end of April. All right, so real quick final exam talk. The final exam is going to open on Tuesday the 7th and it will go until the 13th. So you will have a full seven days to do it. So Tuesday the 7th at 12 a.m. it will open. Monday the 13th it will close at 11.59 p.m. I can't give you any more time than that. I have to have my grades in the next day, but I'm giving you as much possible time as I can. Uh, for this week, do by midnight on 12.06 or 11.59 p.m. 12.06. 
make sure you get your last quizzes done, your last discussion, and your, your SLO essay, and that final reflection paper. Uh, if you have any questions whatsoever about the SLO, please email me. I'm going to be in the office all next week. Um, I'm not going to be teaching classes because my in-person classes will be having finals as well. So if you send me an email next week, I will be able to answer it almost instantly. If you send me an email tomorrow, I'll be able to answer it almost instantly. I am here for you to help you do whatever work is needed, uh, both by Monday and then that final exam as well. So please don't be afraid to reach out and email me. Uh, some of you already have been, and I appreciate that very much. Um, but it's been a good semester. I hope to see some of you in person or at least in one of my online classes in the future. And uh, we'll see you soon. Good luck. We're all counting on you. Bye-bye.